Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series, reading Dracula by Bram Stoker. Without further ado, returning to Dracula, as read by Lord Naren White. The wind suddenly shifted to the northeast, and the remnant of the sea fog melted in the blast. And then Mirabile Dictu, between the piers, leaping from wave to wave as it rushed at headlong speed, swept the strange schooner before the blast with all sail set, and gained the safety of the harbor. The searchlight followed her, and a shudder ran through all who saw her, for lashed to the helm was a corpse with drooping head which swung horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. No other form could be seen on the deck at all. A great awe came on all as they realized that the ship, as if by a miracle, had found the harbor, unsteered save by the hand of a dead man. However, all took place more quickly than it takes to write these words. The schooner paused not, but rushing across the harbor, pitched herself on that accumulation of sand and gravel, washed by many tides and many storms into the southeast corner of the pier, jutting under the east cliff known locally as Tate Hill Pier. There was, of course, a considerable concussion as the vessel drove up on the sand heap. Every spar, rope, and stay was strained, and some of the top hammer came crashing down. But strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up on deck from below, as if shot up by the concussion, and running forward, jumped from the bow on the sand. Making straight for the steep cliff, where the churchyard hangs over the laneway to the east pier, so steeply that some of the flat tombstones Thruff steams, or through stones, as they call them in Whitby vernacular, actually project over where the sustaining cliff has fallen away. It has disappeared in the darkness, which seemed intensified, just beyond the focus of the searchlight. It so happened that there was no one at the moment on Tate Hill Pier, as all those whose houses are in close proximity were either in bed or were out on the heights above. Thus, the Coast Guard, on duty on the eastern side of the harbor, who at once ran down to the little pier, was the first to climb aboard. The men working the searchlight, after scouring the entrance of the harbor without seeing anything, then turned the light on the derelict and kept it there. The Coast Guard ran aft, and when he came beside the wheel, bent over to examine it, and recoiled at once as though under some emotion. This seemed to pique general curiosity, and quite a number of people began to run. It is a good way round from the West Cliff by the drawbridge to Tate Hill Pier, but your correspondent is a fairly good runner, and came well ahead of the crowd. When I arrived, however, I found already assembled on the pier a crowd, whom the Coast Guard and police refused to allow to come on board. By the courtesy of the chief boatman, I was, as your correspondent, permitted to climb on deck, and was one of a small group who saw the dead seamen whilst actually lashed to the wheel. It was no wonder that the Coast Guard was surprised or even awed, for not often can such a sight have been seen. The man was simply fastened by his hands, tied one over the other to a spoke of the wheel. Between the inner hand and the wood was a crucifix, the set of beads on which it was fastened being around both wrists and wheel and all kept fast by the binding cords. The poor fellow may have been seated at one time, 
but the flapping and buffeting of the sails had worked through the rudder of the wheel and had dragged him to and fro, so that the cords with which he was tied had cut the flesh to the bone. Accurate note was made of the state of things, and a doctor, Surgeon J. M. Caffin of 33, East Elliot Place, who came immediately after me, declared after making examination that the man must have been dead for quite two days. In his pocket was a bottle, carefully corked, empty save for a little roll of paper, which proved to be the addendum to the log. The Coast Guard said the man must have tied up his own hands, fastening the knot with his teeth. The fact that a Coast Guard was the first on board may save some complications later on in the Admiralty Court, for Coast Guards cannot claim the salvage which is the right of the first civilian entering on a derelict. Already, however, the legal tongues are wagging, and one young lady, excuse me, one young law student, one young law student, is loudly asserting that the rights of the owner are already completely sacrificed, his property being held in contravention of the statues of Mort Main, since the tiller as emblemship, if not proof of delegated possession, is held in a dead hand. It is needless to say that the dead steersman has been reverently removed from the place where he held his honourable watch and ward till death. A steadfastness as noble as that of young Casabianca, and placed in the mortuary to await inquest. Already the sudden storm is passing, and its fierceness is abating. Crowds are scattering backward, and the sky is beginning to redden over the Yorkshire wolds. I shall send in time for you next issue further details on the derelict ship which found no her no way, way so miraculously into the harbor in the storm. 9 August The sequel to the strange arrival of the derelict in the storm last night is almost more startling than the thing itself. It turns out that the schooner is Russian from Varna and is called the Demeter or Demeter. She is almost certainly in a ballast of silver sand with only a small amount of cargo, a number of great wooden boxes filled with mold. This cargo was consigned to a Whitby solicitor, Mr. S. F. Billington, of Seven, the Crescent, who was this morning ab aboard and took formal possession of the goods consigned to him. The Russian consul, too, acting for the charter party, took formal possession of the ship and paid all harbor dues, etc. Nothing is talked about here today except the strange coincidence. The officials of the Board of Trade have been most exacting in seeing every compliance has been made with existing regulations. As the matter is to be a nine days wonder, they are evidently determined that there shall be no cause of other complaint. A good deal of interest was abroad concerning the dog which landed when the ship struck, and more than a few of the members of the SPCA, which is very strong in Whitby, have tried to befriend the animal. To the general disappointment, however, it was not to be found. It seems to have disappeared entirely from the town. It may be that it was frightened and made its way on the, onto the moors, where it is still hiding in terror. There are some who look with dread on such a possibility, lest later on it should itself in itself become a danger, for it is evidently a fierce brute. We'll go ahead and stop there for this week. As usual, I want to say thank you for watching 
and I hope you enjoyed. Please like, comment, and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel. Light be with you all. Take care, and thanks again.